Bonnie Elizabeth Parker, and Clyde Champion Barrow, were an American criminal couple who traveled the central United States with their gang during the Great Depression, known for their bank robberies, although they preferred to rob small stores or rural gas stations. Their exploits captured the attention of the American press and its readership during what is occasionally referred to as the public enemy era between 1931 and 1934. Bonnie Elizabeth Parker was born in 1910 in Rowena, Texas, the second of three children. Her father, Charles Robert Parker, was a bricklayer who died when Bonnie was one year old. Her widowed mother, Emma Krause Parker, moved her family back to her parents' home in Cement City, an industrial suburb in West Dallas where she worked as a seamstress. As an adult, Bonnie wrote poems such as The Story of Suicide Sal, and The Trail's End, the latter more commonly known as The Story of Bonnie and Clyde. In her second year in high school, Parker met Roy Thornton. The couple dropped out of school and married on September 25, 1926, six days before her 16th birthday. Their marriage was marred by his frequent absences and brushes with the law, and it proved to be short-lived. They never divorced, but their paths never crossed again after January 1929. She was still wearing his wedding ring when she died. Parker briefly kept a diary early in 1929 when she was 18, in which she wrote of her loneliness, her impatience with life in Dallas, and her love of taking pictures. Clyde Champion Barrow was born in 1909 into a poor farming family in Ellis County, Texas, southeast of Dallas. He was the fifth of seven children of Henry Basil Barrow and Kumi Talitha Walker. The family moved to Dallas in the early 1920s, part of a migration pattern from rural areas to the city where many settled in the urban slum of West Dallas. The Barrows spent their first months in West Dallas living under their wagon, until they got enough money to buy a tent. Barrow was first arrested in late 1926 at age 17, after running when police confronted him over a rental car that he had failed to return on time. His second arrest was with his brother Buck soon after for possession of stolen turkeys. Barrow had some legitimate jobs during 1927 through 1929, but he also cracked safes, robbed stores, and stole cars. He met 19-year-old Bonnie Parker through a mutual friend in January 1930. Several accounts describe Bonnie Parker and Clyde Barrow's first meeting. The most credible states that they met on January 5, 1930 at the home of Barrow's friend Clarence Clay at 105 Herbert Street, in the neighborhood of West Dallas. Barrow was 20 years old, and Parker was 19. Parker was out of work and staying with a female friend to assist her during her recovery from a broken arm. Barrow dropped by the girl's house while Parker was in the kitchen making hot chocolate. Both were smitten immediately. Most historians believe that Parker joined Barrow because she had fallen in love with him. Their romance was interrupted when Barrow was arrested and convicted of auto theft. Barrow was sent to Eastham Prison Farm, in April 1930 at the age of 21. He escaped from the prison farm shortly after his incarceration, using a weapon Parker smuggled to him. He was recaptured shortly after and sent back to prison. Barrow was repeatedly sexually assaulted while in prison, and he retaliated by attacking and killing his tormentor with a pipe, crushing his skull. This was his first killing. Another inmate, who was already serving a life sentence, claimed responsibility. In order to avoid hard labor in the fields, Barrow purposely had two of his toes chopped off by either him or another inmate, in late January 1932. Because of this, he walked with a limp for the rest of his life. However, Barrow was set free six days after his intentional injury. Without his knowledge, Barrow's mother had successfully petitioned for his release. He was paroled on February 2, 1932 from East Ham as a hardened and bitter criminal. His sister Marie said, something awful sure must have happened to him in prison, because he wasn't the same person when he got out. Fellow inmate Ralph Fultz said that he watched Clyde change from a schoolboy to a rattlesnake. In his post-East Ham career, Barrow robbed grocery stores and gas stations at a rate far outpacing the ten or so bank robberies attributed to him and the Barrow gang. His favorite weapon was the M1918 Browning automatic rifle. According to John Neal Phillips, Barrow's goal in life was not to gain fame or fortune from robbing banks, but to seek revenge against the Texas prison system for the abuses that he suffered while serving time.
After Barrow's release from prison in February 1932, he and Fultz began a series of robberies, primarily of stores and gas stations. The goal was to collect enough money and firepower to launch a raid against East Ham prison. On April 19, Parker and Fultz were captured in a failed hardware store burglary in Corfman, in which they had intended to steal firearms. Parker was released from jail in a few months, after the grand jury failed to indict her, Fultz was tried, convicted, and served time. He never rejoined the gang. On April 30, Barrow was the getaway driver in a robbery in Hillsborough during which store owner J.N. Butcher was shot and killed. Butcher's wife identified Barrow from police photographs as one of the shooters, although he had stayed inside in the car. Parker wrote poetry to pass the time in jail. She reunited with Barrow within a few weeks of her release from the Kaufman County Jail. On August 5, Barrow, Raymond Hamilton and Ross Dyer were drinking moonshine at a country dance in Stringtown, Oklahoma, when Sheriff C.G. Maxwell and Deputy Eugene Seymour approached them in the parking lot. Barrow and Hamilton opened fire, killing Moore and gravely wounding Maxwell. Moore was the first law officer that Barrow and his gang had killed. Dot. On October 11, they allegedly killed Howard Hall at his store during a robbery in Sherman, Texas, though some historians consider this unlikely. W.D. Jones joined Parker and Barrow on Christmas Eve 1932 at the age of 16, and the three left Dallas that night. He had been a friend of Barrow's family since childhood. The next day, Christmas Day of that year, Jones and Barrow murdered Doyle Johnson a young family man, while stealing his car in Temple. Barrow killed Tarrant County Deputy Malcolm Davis on January 6, 1933 when, he, Parker, and Jones wandered into a police trap set for another criminal. The gang had murdered five people since April. On March 22, 1933, Clyde's brother Buck was granted a full pardon and released from prison, and he and his wife Blanche set up housekeeping with Bonnie, Clyde and Jones in a temporary hideout at 3,347 and a half Oak Ridge Drive in Joplin, Missouri. According to family sources, Buck and Blanche were there to visit, they attempted to persuade Clyde to surrender to law enforcement. The group ran loud, alcohol-fueled card games late into the night in the quiet neighborhood, Blanche recalled that they bought a case of beer a day. The men came and went noisily at all hours, and Clyde accidentally fired a bar in the apartment while cleaning it. No neighbors went to the house, but one reported suspicions to the Joplin Police Department. The police assembled a five-man force in two cars on April 13 to confront what they suspected were bootleggers living in the garage apartment. The Barrow brothers and Jones opened fire, killing Detective Harry L. McGuinness outright and fatally wounding Constable J.W. Harriman. Parker opened fire as the others fled, forcing Highway Patrol Sergeant G.B. Carla to duck behind a large oak tree. The 30 caliber bullets struck the tree and forced wood splinters into the sergeant's face. Parker got into the car with the others, and they pulled in Blanche from the street where she was pursuing her dog Snowball. The surviving officers later testified that they had fired only 14 rounds in the conflict, one hit Jones on the side, one struck Clyde but was deflected by his suit coat button, and one grazed Buck after ricocheting off a wall. The group escaped the police at Joplin, but left behind most of their possessions at the apartment, including Buck's parole papers that were three weeks old, a large arsenal of weapons, a handwritten poem by Bonnie, and a camera with several rolls of undeveloped film. Police developed the film at the Joplin Globe and found many photos of Barrow, Parker, and Jones posing and pointing weapons at one another. The Globe sent the poem and the photos over the newswire, including a photo of Parker clenching a cigar in her teeth and a pistol in her hand, and the gang of criminals became front-page news throughout America as the Barrow Gang. The group ranged from Texas as far north as Minnesota for the next three months. In May, they tried to rob the bank in Lucerne, Indiana, and rob the bank in Okabena, Minnesota. They kidnapped Dillard Darby and Sophia Stone at Ruston, Louisiana, in the course of stealing Darby's car. This was one of several events between 1932 and 1934 in which they kidnapped police officers or robbery victims. They usually released their hostages far from home, sometimes with money to help them return home. Stories of such encounters made headlines, as did the more violent episodes.
The Barrow gang did not hesitate to shoot anyone who got in their way, whether it was a police officer or an innocent civilian. Other members of the Barrow gang who committed murder included Hamilton, Jones, Buck, and Henry Methvin. Eventually, the cold-bloodedness of their murders opened the public's eyes to the reality of their crimes, and led to their ends. The photos entertained the public for a time, but the gang was desperate and discontented, as described by Blanche in her account written while imprisoned in the late 1930s. With their new notoriety, the daily lives became more difficult, as they tried to evade discovery. Restaurants and motels became less secure, they resorted to campfire cooking and bathing in cold streams. The unrelieved, round-the-clock proximity of five people in one car gave rise to vicious bickering. Jones was the driver when he and Barrow stole a car belonging to Darby in late April, and he used that car to leave the others. He stayed away until June 8. Barrow failed to see warning signs at a bridge under construction on June 10, while driving with Jones and Parker near Wellington, Texas, and the car flipped into a ravine. Sources disagree on whether there was a gasoline fire or if Parker was doused with acid from the car's battery under the floorboards, but she sustained third-degree burns to her right leg, so severe that the muscles contracted and caused the leg to draw up. Jones observed, she'd been burned so bad none of us thought she was gonna live. The hide on her right leg was gone, from her hip down to her ankle. I could see the bone at places. Parker could hardly walk. She either hopped on her good leg or was carried by Barrow. They got help from a nearby farm family, then kidnapped Collinsworth County Sheriff George Corrie, and City Marshal Paul Hardy leaving the two of them handcuffed and barbed wire to a tree outside Eric, Oklahoma. The three rendezvoused with Buck and Blanche, and hid in a tourist court near Fort Smith, Arkansas, nursing Parker's burns. Buck and Jones bungled a robbery and murdered town marshal Henry D. Humphrey in Alma, Arkansas. The criminals had to flee, despite Parker's grave condition. In July 1933, the gang checked into the Red Crown Tourist Court south of Platte City, Missouri. It consisted of two brick cabins joined by garages, and the gang rented both. To the south stood the Red Crown Tavern, a popular restaurant among Missouri Highway Patrolmen, and the gang seemed to go out of their way to draw attention. Blanche registered the party as three guests, but owner Neil Hauser could see five people getting out of the car. He noted that the driver backed into the garage, gangster style, for a quick getaway. Blanche paid for their cabins with coins rather than bills, and did the same later when buying five dinners and five beers. The next day, Hauser noticed that his guests had taped newspapers over the windows of their cabin. Blanche again paid for five meals with coins. Her outfit of jodhpur riding breeches also attracted attention. They were not typical attire for women in the area, and eyewitnesses still remembered them 40 years later. Hauser told Captain William Baxter of the Highway Patrol, a patron of his restaurant about the group. Barrow and Jones went into town to purchase bandages, crackers, cheese, and atropine sulfate to treat Parker's leg. The druggist contacted Sheriff Holt Coffey, who put the cabins under surveillance. Coffey had been alerted by Oklahoma, Texas, and Arkansas law enforcement to watch for strangers seeking such supplies. The sheriff contacted Captain Baxter, who called for reinforcements from Kansas City, including an armored car. Sheriff Coffey led a group of officers toward the cabins at 11 p.m., armed with Thompson submachine guns. In the gunfight which ensued, the 45 caliber Thompsons proved no match for Barrow's 30 caliber bar, stolen on July 7 from the National Guard Armory at Enid, Oklahoma. The gang escaped when a bullet short-circuited the horn on the armored car and the police officers mistook it for a ceasefire signal. They did not pursue the retreating Barrow vehicle. The gang had evaded the law once again, but Buck had sustained a bullet wound that blasted a large hole in his forehead skull bone and exposed his injured brain, and Blanche was nearly blinded by glass fragments in both her eyes. The Barrow gang camped at Dexfield Park, an abandoned amusement park near Dexter, Iowa, on July 24. Buck was sometimes semi-conscious, and he even talked and ate, but his massive head wound and loss of blood were so severe that Barrow and Jones dug a grave for him. Local residents noticed the bloody bandages, and officers determined that the campers were the Barrow gang. Local police officers and approximately 100 spectators surrounded the group, and the Barrows soon came under fire. Barrow, 
Parker, and Jones escaped on foot. Buck was shot in the back, and he and his wife were captured by the officers. Buck died of his head wound and pneumonia after surgery five days later at King's Daughters Hospital in Perry, Iowa. For the next six weeks, the remaining perpetrators ranged far afield from the usual area of operations, west to Colorado, north to Minnesota, southeast to Mississippi, yet they continued to commit armed robberies. They restocked their arsenal when Barrow and Jones robbed an armory at Platteville, Illinois on August 20, acquiring three bars, handguns, and a large quantity of ammunition. By early September, the gang risked a run to Dallas to see their families for the first time in four months. Jones parted company with them, continuing to Houston where his mother had moved. He was arrested there without incident on November 16, and returned to Dallas. Through the autumn, Barrow committed several robberies with small-time local accomplices, while his family and Parkers attended to her considerable medical needs. On November 22, they narrowly evaded arrest while trying to meet with family members near Soas, Texas. Dallas Sheriff Smoot Schmid, Deputy Bob Alcorn, and Deputy Ted Hinton lay in wait nearby. As Barrow drove up, he sensed a trap and drove past his family's car, at which point Schmidt and his deputies stood up and opened fire with machine guns and a bar. The family members in the crossfire were not hit, but a bar bullet passed through the car, striking the legs of both Barrow and Parker. They escaped later that night. On November 28, a Dallas grand jury delivered a murder indictment against Parker and Barrow for the killing in January of that year, nearly 10 months earlier, of Tarrant County Deputy Malcolm Davis, it was Parker's first warrant for murder. On January 16, 1934, Barrow orchestrated the escape of Hamilton, Methvin, and several others in the East Ham breakout. The brazen raid generated negative publicity for Texas, and Barrow seemed to have achieved what historian Phillips suggests was his overriding goal, revenge on the Texas Department of Corrections. Barrow gang member Joe Palmer shot Major Joe Croson during his escape, and Croson died a few days later in the hospital. This attack attracted the full power of the Texas and federal government to the manhunt for Barrow and Parker. As Croson struggled for life, Prison Chief Lee Simmons reportedly promised him that all persons involved in the breakout would be hunted down and killed. All of them eventually were, except for Methvin, who preserved his life by setting up the ambush of Barrow and Parker. The Texas Department of Corrections contacted former Texas Ranger Captain Frank Harmer, and persuaded him to hunt down the Barrow gang. He was retired, but his commission had not expired. He accepted the assignment as a Texas Highway Patrol officer, secondarily assigned to the prison system as a special investigator, and given the specific task of taking down the Barrow gang. Harmer was tall, burly, and taciturn, unimpressed by authority and driven by an inflexible adherence to what he thought was right. For 20 years, he had been feared and admired throughout Texas as the walking embodiment of the one riot, one ranger, ethos. He had acquired a formidable reputation as a result of several spectacular captures and the shooting of a number of Texas criminals. He was officially credited with 53 kills, and suffered 17 wounds. Prison boss Simmons always said publicly that Harmer had been his first choice, although there is evidence that he first approached two other rangers, both of whom declined because they were reluctant to shoot a woman. Starting on February 10, Harmer became the constant shadow of Barrow and Parker, living out of his car, just a town or two behind them. Three of Hammer's four brothers were also Texas Rangers. Brother Harrison was the best shot of the four, but Frank was considered the most tenacious. Barrow and Methvin killed Highway Patrolman H.D. Murphy, and Edward Bryant Wheeler on Easter Sunday, April 1, 1934 at the intersection of Route 114 and Dove Road, near Grapevine, Texas. An eyewitness account said that Barrow and Parker fired the fatal shots, and this story received widespread coverage. Methvin later claimed that he fired the first shot, after mistakenly assuming that Barrow wanted the officers killed. Barrow joined in, firing at Patrolman Murphy. During the spring season, the grapevine killings were recounted in exaggerated detail, affecting public perception. All four Dallas Daily Papers seized on the story told by the eyewitness, a farmer who claimed to have seen Parker laugh at the way that Murphy's head bounced like a rubber ball on the ground as she shot him.
The stories claimed that police found a cigar butt with tiny teeth marks, supposedly those of Parker. Several days later, Murphy's fiancé wore her intended wedding dress to his funeral, attracting photos and newspaper coverage. The eyewitness's ever-changing story was soon discredited, but the massive negative publicity increased the public clamor for the extermination of the Barrow Gang. The outcry galvanized the authorities' interaction, and Highway Patrol boss L.G. Fares, offered a reward of $1,000 for the dead bodies of the Grapevine Slayers, not their capture, just the bodies. Texas Governor Mar Ferguson added another reward of $500 for each of the two killers, which meant that for the first time, there was a specific price on Bonnie's head, since she was so widely believed to have shot H.D. Murphy. Public hostility increased five days later, when Barrow and Methvin murdered 60-year-old Constable William Campbell, a widower and father, near Commerce, Oklahoma. They kidnapped Commerce Police Chief Percy Boyd, crossed the state line into Kansas, and let him go giving him a clean shirt, a few dollars, and a request from Parker to tell the world that she did not smoke cigars. Boyd identified both Barrow and Parker to authorities, but he never learned Methvin's name. The resultant arrest warrant for the Campbell murder specified Clyde Barrow, Bonnie Parker and John Doe, historian Knight writes, for the first time, Bonnie was seen as a killer, actually pulling the trigger, just like Clyde. Whatever chance she had for clemency had just been reduced. The Dallas Journal ran a cartoon on its editorial page, showing an empty electric chair with a sign on it saying, reserved, adding the words Clyde and Bonnie. Barrow and Parker were killed on May 23, 1934, on a rural road in Bienville Parish, Louisiana. Harmer, who had begun tracking the gang on February 12, led the posse. He had studied the gang's movements and found that they swung in a circle skirting the edges of five Midwestern states, exploiting the state line rule which prevented officers from pursuing a fugitive into another jurisdiction. Barrow was consistent in his movements, so Harmer charted his path and predicted where he would go. The gang's itinerary centered on family visits, and they were due to see Methvin's family in Louisiana. In case they were separated, Barrow had designated Methvin's parents' residence as a rendezvous, and Methvin became separated from the rest of the gang in Shreveport. Hammer's posse was composed of six men, Texas officers Harmer, Hinton, Alcorn, B.M. Maney Gould, and Louisiana officers Henderson Jordan and Prentice Morell Oakley. On May 21, the four posse members from Texas were in Shreveport when they learned that Barrow and Parker were planning a visit to Bienville Parish that evening with Methvin. The full posse set up an ambush along Louisiana State Highway 154 south of Gibsland towards Sales. Hinton recounted that the group was in place by 9 p.m., and waited through the whole of the next day, with no sign of the perpetrators. Other accounts said that the offices set up on the evening of May 22. At approximately 9.15 a.m. on May 23, the posse was still concealed in the bushes and almost ready to give up when they heard the Ford V8 Barrow was driving approaching at high speed. In their official report, they stated they had persuaded Ivy Methvin to position his truck along the shoulder of the road that morning. They hoped Barrow would stop to speak with him, putting his vehicle close to the posse's position in the bushes. When Barrow fell into the trap, the lawmen opened fire while the vehicle was still moving. Oakley fired first, probably before any order to do so. Barrow was killed instantly by Oakley's head shot, and Hinton reported hearing Parker scream. The officers fired about 130 rounds, emptying their weapons into the car. Many of Bonnie and Clyde's wounds would have been fatal, yet the two had survived several bullet wounds over the years in their confrontations with the law. The bullet-ridden deluxe, originally owned by Ruth Warren of Topeka, Kansas, was later exhibited at carnivals and fairs then sold as a collector's item. In 1988, the Prim Valley Resort and Casino in Las Vegas purchased it for some $250,000. According to statements made by Hinton and Alcorn, each of us six officers had a shotgun and an automatic rifle and pistols. We opened fire with the automatic rifles. They were emptied before the car got even with us. Then we used shotguns. There was smoke coming from the car, and it looked like it was on fire. After shooting the shotguns, we emptied the pistols at the car, which had passed us and ran into a ditch about 50 yards on down the road. It almost turned over. We kept shooting at the car even after it stopped. 
We weren't taking any chances. Actual film footage taken by one of the deputies immediately after the ambush, show 112 bullet holes in the vehicle, of which around one quarter struck the couple. The official coroner's report by parish coroner Dr. J. L. Wade, listed 17 entrance wounds on Barrow's body and 26 on that of Parker, including several headshots on each, and one that had snapped Barrow's spinal column. Undertaker C.F. Boots Bailey, had difficulty embalming the bodies because of all the bullet holes. The deafened officers inspected the vehicle and discovered an arsenal of weapons, including stolen automatic rifles, sawed-off semi-automatic shotguns, assorted handguns, and several thousand rounds of ammunition, along with 15 sets of license plates from various states. Harmer stated, I hate to bust the cap on a woman, especially when she was sitting down, however if it wouldn't have been her, it would have been us. Word of the deaths quickly got around when Harmer, Jordan, Oakley, and Hinton drove into town to telephone their respective bosses. A crowd soon gathered at the spot. Galt and Alcorn were left to guard the bodies, but they lost control of the jostling curious throng. One woman cut off bloody locks of Parker's hair and pieces from her dress, which were subsequently sold as souvenirs. Hinton returned to find a man trying to cut off Barrow's trigger finger, and was sickened by what was occurring. Arriving at the scene, the coroner reported. Nearly everyone had begun collecting souvenirs such as shell casings, slivers of glass from the shattered car windows, and bloody pieces of clothing from the garments of Bonnie and Clyde. One eager man had opened his pocket knife, and was reaching into the car to cut off Clyde's left ear. Hinton enlisted Hammer's help in controlling the circus-like atmosphere, and they got people away from the car. The posse towed the Ford, with the dead bodies still inside, to the Conga Furniture Store and Funeral Parlor in downtown Arcadia, Louisiana. Preliminary embalming was done by Bailey in a small preparation room in the back of the furniture store, as it was common for furniture stores and undertakers to share the same space. The population of the northwest Louisiana town reportedly swelled from 2,000 to 12,000 within hours. Curious throngs arrived by train, horseback, buggy, and plane. Beer normally sold for 15 cents a bottle but it jumped to 25 cents, and sandwiches quickly sold out. Barrow had been shot in the head by a 35 Remington Model 8. Henry Barrow identified his son's body, then sat weeping in a rocking chair in the furniture section. H.D. Darby was an undertaker at the McClure Funeral Parlor and Sophia Stone was a home demonstration agent, both from nearby Ruston. Both of them came to Arcadia to identify the bodies because the Barrow gang had kidnapped them in 1933. Parker reportedly had laughed when she discovered that Darby was an undertaker. She remarked that maybe someday he would be working on her, Darby did assist Bailey in the embalming. Bonnie and Clyde wished to be buried side by side, but the Parker family would not allow it. Her mother wanted to grant her final wish to be brought home, but the mobs surrounding the Parker house made that impossible. More than 20,000 attended Parker's funeral, and her family had difficulty reaching her gravesite. Parker's services were held on May 26. Dr. Alan Campbell recalled that flowers came from everywhere, including some with cards allegedly from Pretty Boy Floyd and John Dillinger. The largest floral tribute was sent by a group of Dallas City newsboys, the sudden end of Bonnie and Clyde sold 500,000 newspapers in Dallas alone. Parker was buried in the Fish Trap Cemetery, although she was moved in 1945 to the new Crown Hill Cemetery in Dallas. Thousands of people gathered outside both Dallas funeral homes, hoping for a chance to view the bodies. Barrow's private funeral was held at sunset on May 25th. He was buried in Western Heights Cemetery in Dallas, next to his brother Marvin. The Barrow brothers share a single granite marker with the names on it and an epitaph selected by Clyde, gone but not forgotten. The six men of the posse were each to receive a one-sixth share of the reward money, and Dallas Sheriff Schmidt had promised Hinton that this would total some $26,000, but most of the organizations that had pledged reward funds reneged on their pledges. In the end, each lawman earned $200.23 for his efforts and collected memorabilia. By the summer of 1934, new federal statutes made bank robbery and kidnapping federal offenses. The growing coordination of local authorities by the FBI, plus two-way radios in police cars, 
combined to make it more difficult to carry out series of robberies and murders than it had been just months before. Two months after Gibsland, Dillinger was killed on the street in Chicago, three months after that, Floyd was killed in Ohio, and one month after that, Babyface Nelson was killed in Illinois. Parker's niece and last surviving relative is campaigning to have her aunt buried next to Barrow. Thanks for watching. For more videos please click like and subscribe.